Welcome everybody to a new episode of Flower Circus Talks and I will quickly get my hat because without my hat nobody recognizes me. <laughs> there we are. <laughs> it's episode 69 already and for today's episode we go uh, down under. Uh, we go to Australia and uh, we're going to talk with uh, Greg Mosson, um, director of Wavex. Wavex is a family-owned business uh, starting uh, just with one client in uh, 1991. And now uh, they are globally connected uh, with a client base across 26 countries and offices in Australia, the US, Kenya, and Ecuador. And uh, Craig has a great story to tell. So uh, let's quickly invite him into the live stream. Greg, welcome. Hey, John, how are you today? I'm fine, thanks. How are you? Very well, thanks. Good morning there, and uh, we've got a hot day here, 33 degrees in Australia. I guess it's a little different for you out there. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm in Kiev at the moment, and uh, actually we've got some strange weather. Uh, we can do some skating, ice skating outside. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was minus, uh, minus 10, but last night we got some rain, so uh, wow. <laughs> it's quite scary wow. outside at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, nice to be here. Yeah. yeah, it's great to have you. I mean, uh, we've been to Australia with Flower Circus Talks already uh, two times. We uh, we spoke with uh, Premium Greens, with Harold, uh, <coughs> Harold, and of course with Adrian as well about uh, about Helix. Helix. Uh, yeah, we will talk about it later as well. Yeah. So uh, for the people who don't know you, can you tell a little bit more about yourself and, and also how you ended up in Australia? Yeah, sure. Uh, I uh, I was born and raised in Zimbabwe and uh, had a wonderful uh, upbringing there. So it was and is a beautiful country. Um, I, my father was with Shell Oil Company and um, and was transferred to Australia. So I after school I moved to Australia where I studied agriculture. Yeah. Uh, just outside Melbourne and um, and then after qualifying I went back to Zimbabwe because. At that stage, the country was booming, and yeah. my father, my my future father-in-law, uh, wanted to set up a large chrysanthemum greenhouse operation, um, and was looking for somebody to help him set it up and run it. So I thought it was a fantastic opportunity. I was only uh, 21 years old. Um, I wanted to go back to obviously see my uh, my girlfriend, who became and is my wife. So I went back to Zimbabwe and uh, worked there for three or four years. Yeah, uh, and then um, obviously, um, you know, we we sort of felt a little bit unsure about the future of the country. Um, we were looking to establish a life for ourselves. Uh, my wife and I were married by that stage, and so made the the tough decision to uh, to immigrate formally to Australia in 1991. Yeah, okay, and that was uh, yeah Zimbabwe was really booming at that time. I mean, uh, it was the second country I think in in terms of, of flower export. Yeah, yeah. Uh, after Kenya in Africa, um, it was, um, you know, um, 50, 60 growers, um, I think close to about uh, a, thousand, a thousand hectares at the peak under greenhouse and, and, and obviously, you know, a very, uh, uh, sadly, a very different story, a story now. Yeah, yeah, unfortunately, I mean, uh, but uh, yeah. who knows, maybe it will come back uh, because, we hope. Uh, yeah, we hope so. So and then uh, you got back to Australia. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, landed in Australia in 1991 um, in the middle of the uh, the biggest recession Australia's ever had. So uh, there were many moments my wife and I sat there uh, wondering what we were doing. Uh, I couldn't get a job. I couldn't get a job. Um, I finally got a job working on a rose farm and. Uh, on Christmas Eve, I'd been there for four months. On Christmas Eve, I was asked to uh, come in for a chat and. Um, I thought I was going to get a Christmas bonus, but I was told uh, that because of the recession, uh, I was going to have to get let go and I was made redundant. So uh, I came home on Christmas Eve uh, <laughs> with, the, with the news that I didn't have a job and um, we, we spent a, a fairly difficult three or four months. And, and, and then fortuitously, we, we, we got visited by one of the large rose growers in Zimbabwe who was on cricket tour. Okay. And uh, he, he knew my father very well and was staying with us and said, well, you know, what are you going to do for yourself? And I said, well, um, I'm not sure. So he said, well, you know, why don't you contact your father-in-law and get him to send you some chrysanthemums and I'll send you some roses um, and, uh, and see how you go. Um, 
And, uh, you know, I try to get some finance to, 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 to establish a small uh, working capital base, but that was very difficult. Yeah. Um, and I finally finally managed to find a bank that would, that would give me a small overdraft to get started. And, yeah, and started with uh, literally 10 boxes, uh, still working out of home. Uh, I, you know, I was actually living with my parents at the time. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, brought, brought uh, a few boxes of roses, a few boxes of chrysanthemums. Um, I was one of the first people to import flowers into Australia. So there was a lot of demand at that stage in winter. There were just literally no flowers in Australia at all. Yeah. Uh, very, very tough quarantine uh, laws, as you would know. So, you know, had a, had a you know, went through all the uh, processes required to get the shipments in. Um, and the boxes sold very quickly, and, and then we went from 10 boxes to 20 boxes to 100 boxes to 200 boxes, um, and, um, and very quickly the business, uh, the business took off. And then in, in my second year, one of the largest export businesses in Australia went broke, and um, so I thought I've got nothing to lose. I'll contact the receiver of that business yeah. and see, see if I could. Um, they, had a, they had a very big wax flower farm, so I contacted the receiver and said, um, you don't know me, but I'd like to sell your crop. You know, they were trying to sell the business at that stage. And he said, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so so um, very quickly I became an exporter as well as an importer, which is what I've always wanted to do because I think having a balance is, is great because, you know, there's different seasons um, and, um, you know, there's exchange rate differences. Um, so importing and exporting you know, um, mitigates the risk of exchange rate movements. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then from there, you know, we've been fortunate enough to grow every year for 29 years. So um, wow. the business grows and, you know, every year we have new challenges, but we, we managed to, to find a way. So we're a very different business now, obviously, to where, where we were when we started. Yeah. No, I mean, you're telling about uh, importing flowers and that it wasn't easy. I mean, it, it was very tough to, to import flowers almost impossible that's why uh, it's only I, you said you started it almost 30 years ago yeah can you explain uh for the people in in, in for example europe uh, <coughs> what needs to happen before the flowers get into uh, a wholesaler so let's say from from africa to to australia it's it's not only the paperwork is it yeah, no, I mean, uh, we have, um, you know, about three years, two years ago, the Australian government, so we used to have mandatory fumigation with methyl bromide on arrival, irrespective of whether there were insects in the shipment or not. Um, the government changed that policy two years ago now to insist that all the flowers pretty much get fumigated offshore prior yeah. to arrival. And that was to offshore the risk, which we supported it, and we've always supported because we think that rewards good growers. Uh, yeah. good clean growers as it should and, and good clean importers. So, um, you know, that's been the major change. But, you know, I mean, roses, chrysanthemums, carnations all need to be devitalized with, with Roundup uh, so that they can't be illegally propagated and, and, and have the potential to spread viruses. And then, of course, we've got, you know, the, um, you know, the fumigation prior to shipment. So, yeah, there's a, there's a, you know, Australia's got the strictest quarantine and biosecurity rules in, in the world. And, and, and so we should because we're an island. And so we have the opportunity, you know, as we have with COVID, really. I mean, we, as I was talking to you off air, you know, we, we now have a week without a single um, COVID case in, in Australia. So being an island, we have that opportunity to, you know, protect our, our, our biodiversity and, and our growers. So we, yeah. we, fully, we fully support that. Uh, I mean that's that's great, and I, and I know some Dutchies uh, there in uh, in Australia, and and I heard the first stories of getting in uh, 50 flower bulbs and uh, and all those things because that was the maximum per person. So yeah, that's yeah, absolutely. That that's yeah, that's not uh, on on any strict or yeah. it's still strict, but it's not uh, limited to 50 bulbs uh, a person anymore. Yeah, no, absolutely. But I mean, that's our, that's one of, that's one of the areas of our business, you know, and exporting is the other. So, you yeah. know, we have a whole, we have a whole department that, you know, sp spends a lot of time making sure that we, we do, we do everything correctly. Yeah, yeah that's great. You've got a picture here. Uh, it's with your father, I think, uh, with the first box. Yeah, that was uh, 19, probably 1992. Yeah. Uh, 
first box going to um, uh, to Switzerland, to Zurich, to Floripak um, in uh, in Zurich, who are still customers of ours twenty nine years later. So okay, um, yeah, we're, we're very proud of that, and you know the relationships that we've had over the years. We've still got customer. We've had customers uh, from from nineteen ninety two, ninety three to to this day. So and that's one of the great things about the flower industry. There's 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 no contracts. There's no uh, there's no written agreements. It's it's very much um, a relation. It's a relationship business. So it's a trust business. And uh, and and yeah, we you know that's one of the things I love about the the business is is the relationships you build up over the years. Yeah, yeah, and and that's why it's maybe even uh, harder in our business that there are no uh, trade shows, uh, exhibitions, and things like that. Ah, I mean. Uh, you know, <laughs> I missed the uh, Holland show for the first time uh, last month, and uh, I couldn't get to Bolle Jan and listen to Rene Froja. Uh, <laughs> so I, I was uh, I was very sad. Uh, I, I missed all my uh, all my Dutch friends at Bolle Jan again. So, but we'll be there next year. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, can't uh, we can't skip two years in a row? No chance, no chance. Uh, so uh, and then it's it's something totally different when there's an online show. It doesn't have the same. It doesn't oh, have. No. It doesn't have Bolleyan. <laughs> it doesn't have Bolleyan, and it's not it's not the same uh, singing to Rene Froja on your own. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, great. Uh, yeah, like you said, the business grew. So uh, from one uh, box uh, here, we can already see a pellet. And I think this is one year later, no, 2012, I think. Yeah. No, I think that's, uh, yeah, that's, uh, I mean, uh, that, that, those are um, my sort of um, partners in the business when we started. So that's probably not much, uh, not, 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 not many years after that. And yeah, yeah the, the business just continued to grow every year, you know, uh, both imports and exports. But we were still very much a trading business. Um, yeah. You know, buying product from growers and and finding customers for it, and and obviously, you know, as 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 we've moved on in the last uh, two to three years, we've moved, you know, we we we're doing far more value adding and far more vertical integration to make sure that we're across the whole chain. Yeah, yeah, I mean that that's something. In those days, it was nice and simple. You, you know, you you found you found some product uh, that the growers wanted to sell, and you found some customers that wanted to buy it. And you put the logistics together, and uh, you made the sale. So uh, it was a nice, um, it was great fun. Yeah, it's like uh, some people starting now in IT business, just uh, somewhere in a small room with a computer, and then just start. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. You can't imagine now starting an export or an import company just uh, without any facilities anymore. No, no, not at all. No, I'm. We're very lucky, and 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 I mean, well, I wouldn't have wanted to go into COVID without you know. Um, being a startup business would have been very, very difficult as well, you know, because I think having a bit of scale um, when it comes to freight negotiations, when freight's tight like it has been, is, has been really important. Yeah, no, that's that's for sure. Freight, I think, is, is worldwide uh, one of the biggest problems at the moment. Sure, uh, sure. There's no, uh, or almost no people flying around the world, and and, and we just uh, got uh, the freight in in the belly, and then it was well, not flying for free, but for a much better rate than it is uh, at the moment. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and I mean for Australia, it's even more difficult because we have uh, we have a complete uh, hard border lockdown, uh, which we've had since March. So um, you know, we, we we literally have no no flights in or out of Australia other than freighters. Yeah, and the, and the odd passenger flight. And then is the government uh, supporting in, in in some way? So so are there any freighters flying or more yeah. flying than they used to? Uh, I mean, we are very fortunate to live in a country like Australia. I mean, um, the government came out with two fantastic policies, which really helped our business incredibly. The first was in March they brought out a scheme called uh, Job Keeper, and. Yeah. and what the government did was it actually subsidized the wages of staff so that employers could keep them on to get through that difficult period. And the next thing they did, which was really innovative for, particularly for governments who are, who are normally quite slow to move, is that they came out with a program called IFAM, the International Freight Assistance Mechanism. Yeah. Whereby, uh, the government 
Um, you had to go through a whole lot of criteria to, to be successful. But once you were successful, the government helped subsidize the difference between the freight rate you paid last year in the normal year yeah. and, and, and what we were being forced to pay this year. And that was very, very important for us, particularly with our wax flower exports. I mean, yeah. wax flower is a filler flower. It's not like roses where you can just charge any, you know, not anything, but you can pass the price on. You know, with wax flour, if, if the price gets too high, it can be substituted very easily for something else. So, you know, we, we were very fortunate in Australia to have a, a very uh, strong government support. Yeah, yeah I mean, the, yeah, uh, it, it has some advantages uh, being an island, but uh, once it comes to export, then there's no flights out or almost no flights out. Yeah. It's, uh, and, it's we're long, and, we're, and we're a long way from most places. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Countries, so uh, yeah. especially Perth. <laughs> yeah, especially Perth. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a, it's a beautiful city, though. But that makes up for it uh, a lot. Yeah. Um, you already told, uh, yeah, from from uh, being at home, uh, starting the business. Uh, yeah, you 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 had your own facilities, but you also started up uh, Helix. Yeah, and that was. Yeah, so that was in 2000, uh, about 2008, 2009, I think. And what was happening was that um, we were struggling to compete on the global market with wax flour. So South Africa was starting. Yeah. Uh, Peru was, was very strong. So we were struggling to compete in the North American market with Peru. We were struggling to compete in Europe with South Africa. Um, and um, and we, we realized that the only way we were going to be able to continue to be competitive was to have the best varieties. And, and because Australia is a high labor cost, it's like Holland, you know, we, we, we yep. have very high labor rates. We have high freight rates. You know, we, we need to be able to charge a, a fairly high price for the product for everybody in the chain to make money. So, so so we had an agriculture department in Western Australia that had been breeding wax flour for about 10 or 15 years. And they got to the point where they said, we really need industry to fund us. Okay. Yeah. We, we cannot continue every year to fund breeding. You guys should take it on. Um, and to my, uh, to my real disappointment, um, the growers refused to continue to fund that program. We also had a couple of private breeders of wax flour that were getting to the end of their working lives. They wanted to retire. Yeah. Uh, and so um, we formed a business called Helix with uh, my business partner, Adrian Parsons, who you've had on this show. Yeah. And, 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 and the, 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 the business, um, the goal of the business was to um, help fund breeding and then to commercialize that, 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 those varieties so that we could um, have the best varieties in the world um, and that we could have a royalty stream that would continue to come in every year through royalties, which would allow us to continue the funding. So we didn't just want to, we didn't just want 10 varieties, we wanted 10 varieties plus a pipeline for the next 50 years. And that's the model that the, that the Helix model, you know, that, that, that we look to establish. Uh, having done that and having a, t I think we had about 10 fantastic varieties that we looked to release. Um, we then found that a lot of the growers, were, you know, growers generally are quite conservative. And, and we found a lot of growers being very conservative, taking up these kind of varieties. Yeah. And so Wayfix made a decision to, to uh, buy farms um, and to do our own growing. And so we put, um, we put 30,000 plants straight in wow. um, and, um, and because we really believed in the product. And, and then, yeah, that's a pick of the very first picking uh, when I had hair um, a lot, uh, and was a lot younger. So, um, you know, we, we and that, that, that fast tracked the varieties into the market because breeding is a very, very slow um, process. And, um, and by having our own farms, we're able to, fast track those varieties. And then yeah. once we got the varieties into the market and we started branding some of the Helix varieties, we then saw um, obviously growers becoming interested, not just in Australia, but around the world. Um, and, and I think we now have a very successful model operating. 
Yeah, what, what's so special about uh, the, the brands or the, the varieties uh, of the wax flower for Helix? What makes them stand <coughs> out? Yeah, um, so um, wax flower is not a very old flower. It, it really got prominence probably in the 80s. Uh, it, yeah. it, it's a native to Australia, to Western Australia actually. And it really got it really got a bit of um, uh, steam up in the in the eighties, but it was very much around varieties that had been taken from the bush, from the wild, um, had been improved slightly, um, but were pr pretty much um, around three or four varieties: a pink, a purple, a white. Um, yeah. They flowered for about three or four weeks each, um, and so. Uh, there wasn't a lot of breeding and and an improvement done. And and one of the problems with early wax flower variety is they're very ethylene sensitive, so they're very prone to flower drop. Yeah. So the new breeding uh, looks to incorporate a parent. Um, uh, I won't bore you with long names, but, but, but we incorporate a parent there that um, is very ethylene tolerant. Um, so we eliminate the flower drop issue. Okay. Um, and then we're looking for, and then we're looking to extend the season for as long as possible. So we now have wax flower from um, in Western Australia from sort of late April all the way through till November now. Um, and it used to be a much much shorter season. So longer season, um, stronger varieties that don't drop their flowers, um, better production. Of course, we're always looking for that. Um, you know, and, and trying to have a mix of all three colors. I mean, wax flower is pretty much limited to three uh, color shades, pink, yeah. pink in, but in pink, white, and purple. So what we try to do is make sure that at all stages, uh, we can have pink, purple, and white available for as long as possible. Yeah. But we're also doing some very cool breeding with um, probably the world leader in, um, in, in wax flower breeding, Kings Park and Botanical Gardens. Yeah. Um, uh, in Western Australia, they're, they're, they're a world-renowned breeding institution and, and they're doing work with Somatic Fusion. Uh, that's the breeder there, Dig, Digby Grounds, who we've had a long relationship with. And what we're trying to do there is, is, is do a crossing, intergeneric crossing. So trying to bring scent in, potentially, yeah. trying to bring um, um, other colours, like red is already in, but we, we want to have more red wax flower. Um, and um, so... You know, so so that's that's where we want the breeding to go. Um, yeah. Earlier, longer, new colours, um, and, and still and still good production. Yeah, and and you say red is in, but but uh, I know a little bit about flowers and about breeding. Uh, once you go from pink is white uh, into the red, uh, we call it uh, quickly red because uh, we're almost there. But then in yeah. two years, two years time, we get more to the real red. It, it, yeah. It's still a pinkish red, or, or are you already getting to the to the real red? Uh, so the variety is, is a very popular, well-known variety called uh, Sweet Sixteen, My Sweet Sixteen, and it it's actually a, a variety that starts white and and turns red. Um, wow. So you can actually pick the flowers when they're white, or you can wait till they mature. As they mature, they turn red. So you're right, John. They, it's not a uh, it's not a pure red. Um, and we're still we're still we're still working on that. I hope I hope we get one before um, before I'm put in the ground somewhere. So um, <laughs> so yeah. So that you know Digby Digby and the guys at Kings Park know that we're um, that we're anxious for a read, especially if we get one at Christmas and then one for Chinese New Year would be wonderful um, yeah. in January February. Yeah, but luckily. Um also, in terms of breeding, you're starting out with, with the pink side. I mean, from pink, in the end, you can go to all the colors. Like we see in chrysanthemums, from pink, you can go to all the colors. While from yeah. yellow, oh, yellow is an end color. You can't, yeah, Maybe you can get orange, but that's it. Yeah. No, absolutely. No, and we, we're very confident that, you know, with Kings Park, with our partnership there, we've got partnerships with private breeders as well. Um, and every year, we, you know, we've got one or two new releases every year. So it's it's really exciting. Yeah, yeah. And then extending the season, better varieties. Uh, Adrian also told bigger flowers, things like that. Yeah, yeah. That makes it makes it stand out, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You can see a picture of uh, of some trials as well. 
Yeah, that's our, that's our that's our farm about 150 kilometers north of Perth, and um, that's our trial block there. Um, and and what's quite cool, we also get quite a lot of um, you know bee activity and and just natural natural variations, natural yeah. crops come up, um, you know, which is pretty cool as well. So um, yeah, it's a, it's a really exciting um, space. It takes a long time to get a return, but it's. Uh, it, it's 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 a real passion of mine yeah but i think if if you're uh you're, you're trading so you exactly know what the market wants although it's difficult to to foresee what what's going to happen in in five or ten or twenty years but still you're closer to the market so uh your input is is, is great i think for for breeding yeah absolutely yeah no, we know exactly what our customers want um mm -hmm. And um, you know, it's also great that you know we we have a we have a trial release program where we start with a small quantity, you know, of plants, and then we go to larger replications, and then and then finally release. So you know, when we go to the larger replications, we're in a, we have enough material to have a commercial shipment of one or two boxes to each of our you know very important partner type ca uh, customers, and yeah. where we're able to say, you know, what do you guys think of this? You know, please take it through to your customers. So we can get some feedback as well. So yeah. you know, being, being in control of, of that part of the chain is um, is is very valuable. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's so much information lost in the in the whole flower chain. It's quite a long chain, and, and sure. yeah, uh, controlling it from the breeding part until having the contact with the customers and, and and or showing it to the customers yourself gives you a really big advantage. I think a lot of breeders uh, would would love to be in the same uh, position there. No, it's great. I, I think it's, think it's a really, uh, I think it's a really good, robust, robust uh, model for us. And and you know, for, it's great for our growers. You know, I mean, our growers have gone from growing, you know, really low value, you know, um, the old varieties like Purple Pride and Snowflake and some of these variety names which have been around since the '80s, and now they, you know, now they're into really, um, you know, high returning hybrid varieties. So. You know, it's it's really nice to see our growers um, being profitable. Yeah, as well. Yeah, that, that's great. Uh, you already said uh, you've got uh, two farms, or you started with two farms as well. Uh, is it only uh, wax flower you're growing there, or do you have some other uh, crops over there as well? No. So so as we got into the breeding, you know, we started um, we started um, being offered other varieties other than wax flower. Baronia is a very popular one, and that needs a completely different climate. Um, and we're also do, doing a little bit of work with the supermarkets that you know require leucodendrons and pink cushions and proteas and feature flowers for the supermarket. So yeah. so we bought a uh, an existing farm that had been very badly run down about three years ago. And um, and we now and we've now re reinvigorated that farm, and um, you know we we're looking at planting new varieties of leucodendrons, new varieties of proteas, and new varieties of baronia. So the climate and the soils that those varieties need are very different to the soils that wax flower needs. Yeah. Wax flower really does well on um, you know whenever wherever I see uh, wheat wheat growing in sandy soil, you know that's pretty good for wax. So very um, you know, it can grow in very poor sandy soils, can tolerate very high summer temperatures. Yeah. Uh, and obviously that's not the case for for most flowers. No, no, not at all. <laughs> so we've got so we've got farms that are specialized in different different areas. We've got farms that specialize in banksias, which is a very important flower for us, both in the fresh market and the dry market. Yeah. Uh, we've We've got a wax flower farm. We've got a protea and a leucodendron farm as well. So we've got a nice cross section of um, of varieties um, coming through. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Australia. You've got so many beautiful flowers there. Just also growing in the wild, which makes it uh, yeah uh, great. And, 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 and we have different climate zones. Obviously, uh, yeah. being a country, you know, with different microclimates. The premium green guys growing foliages up in. Uh, you know, in the tropical parts of Queensland, you know, which are completely different. You know, you couldn't grow, you can't grow wax flower up there uh, because they have summer rains and, and and a whole different climate. But it's very yeah. good that we can we can grow a, a, a wide range of products. Yeah, yeah, you got so many different climate zones that uh, even the the longiflorum lily. Uh, I 
if I'm correct, in, in Melbourne, it's called the November lily. And in uh, Sydney, it was the December lily, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, come at different times. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's what we're trying to do with the wax flower as well, because we know that, for example, wax flower flowers earlier in Queensland, even though it's difficult to grow, then Western Australia flowers next. And then yeah. Victoria, as you've just mentioned, being colder, flowers last. So, you know, by spreading the varieties between the three different zones, it gives our customers an even wider uh, or a longer supply period. Um, yeah. So it normally takes us maybe three weeks to pick a variety. But if we grow that same variety in Queensland, WA and Victoria, we can actually get nine weeks um, theoretically, which is fantastic for our customers. Because one of the frustrations with customers is they just start getting used to the particular variety and it's it's finished and the next one's on. On so, one hand, uh, florists want to work with seasons, but if they don't know a flower, they want to have it year round because they ask for it in the strangest times. It's also yeah, has to do with the knowledge, of course, but uh, that's yeah. what happens. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 through our licensees, Helix licensees in Israel and California now, you know, we can we hope that we can supply our customers now with product um, all year round. Yeah. Um, months of the year from Australia and South Africa, um, and then six months of the year from um, you know from from Israel and um, and California. Yeah. Uh, that's great. But the system you do in, in, in Australia going from one area to another is almost like they do in, uh, in the UK with the daffodils. Yeah, go, absolutely. Go from south uh, up to north. Yeah, and the peonies as well, you know, the yeah. different for the peonies as they come in. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's good fun. Yeah, yeah, it, it really is. Uh, later on, you started uh, upmarket uh, Souverain. Souverain. Uh, can you tell us a mid, bit more about that? It was a, a special brand. Yeah, so I mean, um, you know, branding is something that we've always uh, focused on. Um, we, we we sit quite a long way back in the distribution chain, so it's very difficult sometimes for us to get our products known by the florists at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, and so some form of branding that 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 goes with the with the product. Um, you know, we have found to be very powerful. Um, and so uh, our sovereign brand um, was launched probably in about at about the same time as, uh, you know, about 2007, 2008. And what we were trying to do there was um, we believe we've got, it actually started with Hypericum where we believed we had the best Hypericum in the world that comes out of, um, comes out of uh, our good friends in Ethiopia. Yeah. And, and, and we were, we, we were facing cheaper competition um, yeah. of a substandard product. Um, and, and what we were seeing was that some of the, our wholesalers were choosing to buy the cheaper product. Um, and that was not necessarily the choice of the florist. So we yeah. wanted to get a message through to the florist that, you know, if you want the best product, it's in a sovereign sleeve and you need to ask for it. And so, and that was the concept behind the brand. Um, it's been very successful. Um, we're looking at expanding it. Uh, we've got four or five products in it. It, it. It's a brand that we put the what we consider to be the best flowers in the world yeah. go, in, go into that brand. Um, and obviously, we need to have an exclusive from the growers because otherwise, you know, in, unless we can control the branding part of it, you know, it's very difficult. So it's not it's not for everything, but we've it's been very successful for us. Okay. Yeah. And uh, it's for you, it's uh, quite difficult to sit still, I think. So uh, I think it was one or two years later, you started uh, to open an office in the, in the US. Yeah. How, um, how <laughs> well, what we saw happening in the US, the US was was and is our one of our biggest export markets. Yeah. Um, they love wax flour there. Obviously, a lot grows in California, so they know the product. And Australia comes in when California finishes. So... Yeah, and what we saw happening in the U.S. market was that the importers um, were disappearing. Um, if I go back 20, 25 years, we had four customers and they could buy everything we could produce. You yeah. know, um, two on the West Coast, one on the East Coast, one sort of one, one in the middle of the U.S. And, and they were importers supplying wholesalers. And what we saw was the importers 
as the distribution chain has got shorter and shorter, the importers have disappeared. And so it became very difficult for us to service wholesalers and florists from Australia. We're in a different time zone. Um, the, 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 they're not buying big volumes. You know, yeah. they might be five or 10 boxes of mixed wax. You know, they're not buying, they're not buying a ton or two. So, um, so we thought that um, for us to continue having a presence in the market, we really needed people on the ground there. And so I, I, I spent about six weeks in the US, um, also around about 2008, 2009. And, you know, and we started the office uh, shortly after that. Um, actually, sorry, there was a long gap, actually, because we couldn't really find the right person that we needed. Um, and then um, and then we, we found the right person uh, in, in Steve, uh, Steve Dion. And, and so we started the office uh, about six or seven years ago. Yeah. And we have a, have a team of four or five salespeople. Um, and, you know, we're obviously, um, you know, we're obviously at trade shows and that's us at the, um, uh, I think, California Fun in the Sun or something with some good South African um, and the premium green guys even there in their yeah. jackets. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we do a bit of joint marketing with the premium greens guys as well. So so the, that was the U.S. office and we followed that up with um, uh, an office in Ecuador and, and an office in Kenya as well because they were our most important sourcing countries. Um, and as the biosecurity issue became more and more complicated and difficult mm -hmm. and we're buying 30 or 40 growers and we need to consolidate them and they've all got to be on a pallet and freight needs to be configured or the paperwork needs to be right. Um, we felt it was easier to have our own people on the ground. And of course, on top of that, we can now service our export customers around 26 countries, as you mentioned, around the world. They can now buy product from, um, from Wayfix almost on a one-stop shop basis. They can buy Australian product. They can buy Kenya product. They can buy Ecuadorian product. Um, and even California wax flour, we've started exporting during the season. Okay. So, so, so that was the um, that was the thinking behind, you know, having some having some people on the ground over there. Because yeah. Australia is way away, and we we're in a quite remote uh, time zone, so it makes it makes trading um, quite difficult unless you're really prepared to have a twenty four hour office. Yeah, <laughs> that's what you had probably the first few not, years so when you started. Not, <laughs> not too many people like working um, from six yeah. in the evening to six in the morning. <laughs> no, that's uh, yeah. yeah, but it's flower business. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, having businesses all over the world, you started something with with one of my favorite flowers actually, or you named it after uh, one of my favorite flowers, the the Warato Ritz brand. Yeah, so uh, that's a brand that um, you know we still um, it's uh, we what what we wanted to do was to come up with a with a high value branded um, uh, wildflower pro program. Yeah, um, and 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 to be fair, that brand still needs some work. So we've got it. Um, it's it's sort of one of our projects um, for the new year to look at how we can. Um, you know, we're starting to do a lot of work with, we're starting to produce a lot of value-added wildflower bouquets now. Um, and, and again, I think it's something that we could use use that brand on because, you know, we, we, we have a design for a wildflower bouquet for a month. It's not, we're not using bits and pieces. We're not using product that can't be sold. We actually have um, a recipe and a design that our, our designers work on and agree on. Um, and so we do have competition from, you know, um, obviously um, companies that are using a while, a mixed bouquets as a way of getting rid of their surplus or their product yeah. that can't sell. And, and, and that's hard for us to compete on price. So, so we're looking at that brand and, and we think there's some work we can do on that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's so many nice flowers. I'll also show a picture because uh, first time I got it in in Holland, I was, yeah. I was amazed. It's so beautiful. I, I took it it's home a, as well because <laughs> it, it is a beautiful flower. It is. It, 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 sadly, it's a it's a flower that we haven't had a lot of success on exporting. Um, it's it's quite a fragile product, and 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 if it gets heated in transport, you know the bracts turn black quite quickly. Yeah. So it's, it's quite a soft flower to export, and. Um, we we export it, but we 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 prefer to only export at short distances. Uh, it can't take 
long transit times, which is sad. But there's this tremendous local demand um, for that product. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, it, it's yeah, it's a pity that it's uh, yeah, it, it's yeah, it's gone transported long, and then especially now with 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 the difficulties with transporting uh, flowers all over the world, makes it even more difficult uh, probably. Yeah, no, absolutely. But I think what COVID has done is, you know, we have certainly seen a a very strong uh, demand and trend for wildflowers in Australia. The, the the domestic market, the consumption and the demand for wildflowers has 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 um, you know has risen exponentially this year. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure, what the reasons behind that are? I think uh, you know, particularly the the younger generation really. Um, are, are in love with wildflowers and um we, we 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 it's fantastic we're seeing really really strong demand for it yeah i think this whole COVID is is creating a whole generation who uh is more interested in nature again i mean uh, yeah. if we if you look in europe or in holland uh, everybody was paving their uh their gardens because it was just difficult to have a garden and now people uh, like in australia uh, loving wildflowers again in the US, they call it homesteading. Uh, they try to, to grow their own vegetables again. Yeah, uh, I, I I think that's absolutely the case, and we see that. Um, you know, we see that we do a lot of dry and preserved flowers as well, and um, we see that in that segment of our business growing dramatically as well. And um, you know, I think uh, you know, I've seen the dry and preserved flowers go up and down over the years, and um, we you know. Well, obviously, when the artificial flowers came in, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago, they really hit hit the dry and preserved business. Yeah. Really, I mean, our business really felt it. But I'm I'm sensing that that's coming back again. Um, we, we've seen really strong demand for dry and preserved flowers, and I think that's a trend that's going to continue for some for some time. I I hope. Yeah, yeah. You see, uh, you really saw it coming up uh, this year in uh, in Europe. And you already see it. Yes, it spreads. I mean, that's that's the nice thing of internet. You just put it on yeah. Pinterest, Facebook, uh, Instagram. People see it from all over the world, and they want to have it as well. Yeah, it's uh, it's good and it's bad because uh, you know we have uh, you know Kim Kardashian has a bouquet with King Proteas on, and suddenly everyone wants uh, <laughs> King Proteas, and we try to explain to them that well, that firstly they only grow for a certain time of the year. And secondly, you know, they're not all sitting on a shelf that we can just pull them out, you know. So, uh, but yeah. it, overall, it's fantastic. And f I think flowers, flowers um, are such a visual product that they really suit Instagram. They really suit social media very well. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we, we, we're doing a lot in that space. Yeah, I mean, content wise, a lot of industries have problems because if you're selling uh, insurances, how to make a nice picture of an insurance. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And we don't have that problem. I mean, uh, you know, we've got um, a, a wonderful girl, Cassie, who um, runs our Instagram for us. And every morning I wake up and I see the images she's posted. And I, and, and I even even I know, know it's our own product, but I go, wow, you know, that that's uh, that's fantastic. It's beautiful. Yeah, so and it's really worth worthwhile uh, following uh, your Instagram page. Uh, so this morning, I saw some really nice things uh, continuous here. Oh, that's my son. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, you know that's the kind of stuff. Even I, I didn't know that's in our, that that was in our Melbourne office, and I, I I didn't know we were buying that product. And so when I woke up to that this morning, that was like, oh wow. <laughs> yeah. So really nice things. Uh, as a florist, if you want to see something special, then, uh, then you can look at the, the Instagram. Uh, if I'm correct, it's Helix underscore Australia. No, that's uh, that's the breeding business, but uh, okay. we're, we're Wavex underscore. Ah, yeah, Wavex underscore Australia. Uh, this is uh, Scoltsia for the people who want to know. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's um, that's off our farm in uh, in Western Australia. It's just started flowering. Ah, I think that's the first bunch. So it's a, it's a, it's actually a great product because we don't actually have wax flower now. It's finished. Our season yeah. finished uh, one or two weeks ago. But this product is not uh, dissimilar, um, and it runs all the way through to the end of January. So it's a beautiful product, and we can tint it. You know, we have a okay. we have a fa we have a fantastic um, dyeing and tinting department, so we can color it red for Christmas. Anything anything you like. 
Yeah, yeah. I just already showed a picture, I think, where we had the Banksias uh, tinted as well. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's one of the things that we um, take a lot of pride in. I think, I think we do, you know, I, I think we do it better than anyone else because what we do is we don't allow the dye to go onto the leaves. So if you pull up that picture, I think you'll see uh, that the, the, the Banksias themselves are colored, but the leaves are not colored. And that takes a that takes a lot of skill. A lot of co companies will just dip the whole thing because it's a lot yeah. quicker uh, and it's a lot cheaper. But uh, we go to we go to a lot of uh, we we see that as a real competitive advantage um, to be able to to tint the product um, that well. Yeah, no, it, it it is. I mean, uh, it's it's a beautiful product, and if you tint it too quick, but th that's something uh, I see a lot of or a lot of growers doing. They are caring about the product, sometimes uh, a month, sometimes up to a year. And when it comes to the final stage of cutting the flower, it's such a precious moment to cut it in the right stage, things like that, or to, to tint it. Just be careful. You you took care of it for a year. <laughs> so yeah. that, that 30 se last 30 seconds or minute, <laughs> please be careful. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we always say the value is created in the packing shed, really. You know, and, and yeah. how you and how you and how you handle the flowers and the post harvest treatment and and how you pack them for transport. Uh, so that's you're you're quite right, John. That that's where the that's where the real value is created. You know. Yeah, yeah, and it's uh, sometimes it's difficult to see. I mean, if you're a grower, you're always busy. You just pack your flowers and you never visit or contact your yeah. your customers, especially if if you just bring them to the auction like a lot of growers in Holland do. And they don't know who their final customer is. Yeah, it's difficult to get feedback as well about your packing things like that. Yeah, absolutely. No, very important. Uh, like you already mentioned, uh, we showed a picture with your son. It's a, it's a real family bus business. So we've got a, a yeah. picture of your family as well. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, uh, my daughter on the left and um, and my son. So um, yeah, my daughter's been with the business now for three years. She's a, an account manager here in Perth, and my son's in Melbourne. Um, and looking to, um, you know, move back to Perth in February, March. Um, okay. that's, my, that, that's my mother who, who does all the gardens and, and make sure that, you know, we've got a beautiful place to, um, you know, to have our lunch uh, and, and, and tea breaks. And, and that's, my, that's my wife who, um, you know, keeps me on the straight and narrow and, and has, has been a great support for me for, you know, throughout my whole life. Yeah, running a great business is nothing, uh, or uh, it only helps when you have a great family behind you. Oh, absolutely. No, I mean, that's very, very important because it's also an extremely stressful business, as, as you know. And, um, you know, it's 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and, uh, and every day and every week brings a new challenge. So, you know, you need to have a very, it's very important that you have a very good um, support network. You know, it's a bit like I say, it's like the boxer. You know, he goes back into the corner at the end of the at the end of the round, and he's got the people um, there to, you know, and kind of look after him and get him ready for the next for the next round. That's what it certainly what the last seven months feels like. Yeah, been beating up all the time. <laughs> getting beaten up. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So, but, uh, so it's uh, it's 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 very very important. Yeah, but I, I'm, I'm actually sure that you will come out better. I mean, you started in a crisis. Every time there was a crisis, you came out uh, stronger. So uh, I'm quite uh, yeah curious what, what what's up your mind or what's in your sleeve uh, up your sleeve at the moment and what will come out uh, soon. Yeah, I mean, we, we when COVID hit, we um, we we made some pretty tough decisions um, about the business. I mean, we had to, we had three sites actually in Melbourne. Yeah. And we, we, we can. So we used the opportunity to make some really uh, not big changes, but some just to fast track some plans that we'd had that we thought we would do, and we thought let's just do them. So yeah. we we merged three sites into two. Um, we ha had been working on a, a new ERP software system for uh, about two years. So we went live on the first of April because. <laughs> We had very we had very few transactions yeah. um, and very very little invoicing being done. So we thought let's just let's just get it done. 
So uh, we went live with a new system. We're now optimizing it um, and making sure that it's uh, fit for, for purpose. Um, this weekend, we will launch our new website. We've been working on the website for um, uh, for quite a long time, but quite slowly. Yeah. We, made, we made a decision that through COVID, we would get our website completed. So um, it won't be ready today, but I think it will be ready on Monday. Okay. So, and, and I'm quite proud of the way that that's come together. So website, ERP, um, you know, rationalizing the branches. We do, we're starting to do a bit of work with the supermarkets. Um, you know, um, you know, we, we're looking at recruiting a few, a few more um, account managers, uh, particularly in our um, sort of uh, Melbourne operation, um, yeah. to to continue to drive the business. So, yeah, we're not, we're not, we're not, we're not um, slowing down. We we yeah. have lots, of, we have lots of plans, um, and 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 in terms of the farms, we've got about another twenty five thousand plants that we have put in over the last. Uh, one to two months and that planting will continue through to about march so then the three then the four farms will be fully planted uh and so that production still has to come on in in two or three years time so um you know that brings extra sales in itself so we have to be ready for that um yeah so so we also have a an expansion of both the perth and the melbourne facilities with more cool rooms more fumigation facilities so that we can cope with the extra production when it comes in yeah. So, uh, so we've got a great team, and um, yeah, we 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 we're looking forward to the future. And I I think for everyone in the industry, it's an exciting time because you know um, all those weddings and events that haven't been able to happen for the last six months, many of them are still going to happen. Um, yep. You know, some have been cancelled and some have gone ahead anyway. But you know, for us, uh, our wedding season is March and April and October, November. And I, I think we're going to have a very, very busy March and April period, as long as there's no major um, sort of um, lockdown or, um, you know, third wave. Um, so, and I think that's the same for everyone in the flower industry. I, I yeah. you know, I think it's yeah. going to, I think we're going to come out of this a lot stronger. Yeah, me too. I, like uh, we already mentioned, there's a whole new uh, generation coming uh, of people interested in gardening in flowers, things like that. Uh, which yeah. will benefit us for for many many years to come. So so that's yeah. great. Uh, I hear good stories about uh, Christmas time uh, in Russia. There was a, a Mother's Day which was uh, in the end of November, which was record high. Uh, yeah. So what you also see is people uh, yeah, almost go back to to uh, giving flowers instead of perfume or other things. Uh, yeah. I agree with you. I, I, I mean, the thing that I'm most happy about through COVID, although it's been a, obviously a terrible crisis, is that flowers have shown to be very resilient. You yeah. know, I mean, people say, oh, well, maybe it's a discretionary spend. Maybe it's something you buy if you've got some extra money. I don't think that's the case. I think it has shown that it's an essential part of our lives. Um, and, and it is almost the, the perfect gift to give somebody to let them know you're thinking of them. And yep. um, so flowers have been um, have been extremely um, have shown to be extremely resilient through this period, and I think it's been a great test case to show that you know because um, you know we had we had the before and then we had the after COVID sort of thing, and, and we definitely saw you know flower consumption going up, particularly with those companies that um, had online platforms. Yeah, yeah. Is it also something you are, you are focusing on online platforms more now? With the, with the new website, for example? Or? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we've got the new website, but we've also got the new ERP system. And, and now we can start bolting onto that platform, whatever whatever uh, shop front we want. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, next 12 months is going to be a very big focus for us around um, you know online. We also have a wholesale business that we bought two years ago called Teslas. And, um, and the business... Um, has um, has been growing tremendously since we bought it, um, and you know we're looking at um, we're looking at making sure that we've got a really good web shop for that business. In fact, we we're talking to some Dutch companies about that because you guys do it better than anyone else. So yeah. we don't need we don't need to reinvent the wheel. So you know it, it's going to be an exciting um, uh, twelve to eighteen months for us. 
Yeah, and I mean, if you talk about flowers and you say Teslas, I think almost everybody knows it in Australia, Teslas. Well, uh, well, they're they're a great flower family. So you know, yeah. um, so there's uh, there, there's brothers that are they're brothers in the in the bulb business. There's brothers in the uh, rose breeding business, and then there's brothers that had the wholesale business. It's the wholesale business that we bought. So, uh, but it's. It's a very famous uh it's a very famous australian family uh, flower name yeah yeah but uh the same uh, is for you with with wavefix everybody knows wavefix as well so that's uh <laughs> combining those two that's that's great <laughs> <laughs> thank you yeah oh, it's uh, it's really great uh, talking to you i mean uh, yeah you've got such a great story is there anything you want to add uh, to the viewers and the listeners <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it's just been great chatting to you, John. I mean, uh, normally there's a lot of travel involved in this business and I'm normally on an aeroplane, you know, every month and yeah. I haven't been on a plane since March, so uh, or late February, actually. So just chatting to you has been uh, a great pleasure. Uh, I think, uh, you know, for all of the, for those in the industry who are in the event space um, and we've got some wonderful customers who I know are feeling it um, really going through some really tough times. You know, I think it's important just to stay positive. Um, I do think we're coming to the back end of this thing and, I, and I'm very confident that there'll be a great feeling of relief for everybody and everyone's going to want to celebrate. There's going to be lots of events. There's going to be lots of weddings that have been um, postponed. And, and I really think that 2021 um, could, could be a really, really strong year for the flower industry, for everyone in, in the chain. So... Yeah. Um, you know, everyone just needs to stay positive. We, I think we're coming out of this. Yeah. Stay positive and get ready for a fantastic year. I, I believe so. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, and everybody, uh, thank you for watching and, uh, and listening. Next week, we'll have uh, Arjen Smit from uh, Tulip Promotion uh, Holland. Uh, of course, uh, Tulip season in Holland is uh, starting now, so he's going to tell uh, all about it. So uh, tune in uh, next week as well. And uh, thank you for watching. Thanks.